you really do have a very, very fascinating story, and one that I think that many of us can relate to from so many different levels. And she has lived and traveled all over the world, and has spent um, a year in Belize. I'm not going to tell any more than that, because no. I'm going to let you go from there. But thank you for coming this evening. We are so honored to have you. Thank you. You're welcome. Good evening, everyone, and thank you so much to Stella and Laura and to Eve Gumpel, who isn't here, but if you ever need an editor, if you decide to write a book or any, anything at all, I highly recommend Eve. I think she made, well, she turned my book into something much better than it was originally, so um, I wish she was here, but I was asked to speak about two different topics this evening. The first one is how we reconnected our family in Belize. And the second topic is don't let your budget get in the way of your dreams. So um, I want to find out how many of you have ever reached a point in your life where you were just ready to chuck it all and <laughs> go to your dream right now. Everybody raise your hand. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's exactly where we were. And um, the reason that we went through this, and I'll give examples, and you can tell me which ones relate to you. Stress at work, unhappy with your job, long commutes on gridlocked freeways, problems with kids, especially teenagers, especially defiance, peer pressures, and entitlement attitudes of young people in Orange County especially. Um, then <laughs> trouble with keeping up with all your bills, and your kids begging for more stuff constantly. So in our case, it was all of the above. And the way that my husband and I handled it was we packed our life in 10 Walmart suitcases, sold our house, sold our cars, sold our furniture, and just said, that's it, we're moving. And the reason we did that was basically, it didn't just happen in one day that you had to research, but things were escalating to a point with my oldest son, who was 16 at the time, that we had to do something. And most people will ship their kid off to a behavior modification school or something like that. But the cost of those places, I mean, it was crazy. So we decided to do it a different way. And you might say, well, who are you and why would you do this? Well, with my background, I was born in Denmark. I lived in West Africa, in Nigeria, for the first six years of my life. Then I lived in Paris, then I lived in England, went to boarding school in England, went to university. So for me, uh, you know, traveling and moving to another country is just in my genes. My husband hadn't, but he wanted to experience some adventure. And here's where my story begins. So in 2004, our sons were 16, 13, and 10. And as I said, we reached that point where we were just fed up with everything. And we went from this uh, beautiful five-bedroom house here in Lake Forest um, on the lake, which you might be familiar with, the uh, LF2, Lake Forest 2. In one day, we went from this to a hut on stilts. And uh, you can imagine what three teenage or two teenagers and a 10-year-old would think. Um, we, uh, like I said, wanted to get away from materialism. We didn't agree with uh, buying, for example, a brand new car for our 16-year-old. Not that we could afford that, but some people were buying brand new BMWs. We was, or I in particular, was fed up with all these gifts under the tree and seeing my kids open one, throw the paper, next, next. That was very frustrating. And um, my husband was... Uh, not spending enough time with the boys. And he was so busy with his long commutes. He had a high stress job. And I worried about his health and him having a stroke or a heart attack in his 40s. So we longed for a simple life and we wanted to escape to the Caribbean. The problem is everything was so expensive. And had it not been for a leaking toilet in my house, I would never have found out about Belize. 
because the plumber who came to fix it was a Scottish guy, and having lived in Europe, we connected, and I was asking him, so where do you want to retire? And he said, well, Belize. And I said, where is it? I've never heard of it. This was 2003, and uh, not many people had heard of Belize. And so he told me it used to be British Honduras. Well, I had no clue <laughs> where British Honduras was either, but <laughs> I wish I had a little clicker thing, but it's that tiny country there, Belize. Mexico is the orange country. Guatemala, Honduras, and Belize is right there. So it's south of Mexico, the next country down. So that I, I got so excited with that when that plumber told me that you could find oceanfront property for $50,000. I said, he's lying. There's no way. So I spent my whole day Googling Belize, looking at all these properties, and when my husband came home from work, I said, guess what? I found a place we could move. So we got so excited, we, we started focusing on Belize, and of course our kids thought we were joking. I mean, they didn't think we were really serious about this, and parents would constantly ask me, so what do your kids think? And I would say, well, excuse me, but who makes the decisions that you're home? You or your kids? And a lot of parents thought I was crazy, but in my opinion, I would say, well, you know, I come from Europe. I can say whatever I want. <laughs> so um, we thought it was time to check out Belize. So we took a 10-day scouting trip. And we, of course, had studied three different locations that we wanted to check out for a potential home. And we, uh, there were no rental cars when we got to the airport. And we just decided just to play, play around, have fun. There was one old Suzuki Samurai that was left. It was all rusty, and my husband and I just said, this is our adventure, and we had the best 10 days looking at properties um, in northern Belize, on the island of Ambergris Key, which is a tourist island, which is beautiful, and a lot of Americans and Europeans live there, and then in the south, in Placentia. And um, we were... Uh, of course, uh, I, what I wanted to do was give you a little excerpt from my book about what, what the children were like in Belize, because that was a big shock for me. And so, we continued along the famous Hummingbird Highway, the most scenic route in Belize, and drove through the lush rainforests of the Maya Mountains. Barefoot kids walked alongside the road, sucking on juicy mangoes with orange flesh, dripping like ice cream cones in the heat. Some kids stopped to stare at us at our white faces. Others started running as if trying to beat our car to the finish line. Solitary shacks appeared with nothing but a hammock inside them. A few chickens roamed the premises, and sometimes a lone, skinny cow or a horse remained close to a shack. I wondered whether the cow or the horse represented a local status symbol, the Belizean version of the Mercedes on the driveway. What a different environment from ours back home. What would my boys think? So all those things were going through my head when we were looking around. So um, what happened was the hut that you saw, we moved to that, and we lived in that hut with no glass in the windows, a palm-fronded roof, Geckos, scorpions, all kinds of critters living with us, and of course the boys hated it. They wouldn't get out of the hut. I mean, it was, it was not fun. And when a scorpion came out the drain, the first time that my middle son took a shower, he said, I'm never going to wash ever again in this country. So uh, they stayed in the hut. They wouldn't come out. And then finally they started exploring the jungle which was behind the hut, and unfortunately, my middle son touched a poison uh -huh. tree. And this is the, the best part of it. You should have seen his face. His oh. eyes got completely swollen, and we, I mean, I thought I was the worst mother because I had to take him down to the local hospital. A Cuban doctor didn't speak English. My son didn't know what we were doing, and uh, I was worried about AIDS and all those things, and it took five weeks for him to, for the swelling to go. So this happened within the first two weeks of moving there. Um, then it was Alex's birthday, 
and he turned 14. Well, we had no presents because there's nothing to buy in Belize. <clears throat> and well, except touristy stuff, but you know, what 14 year old wants that? So we took him to see the Mayan ruins of Lamanai. And of course, they didn't want to go. It's like, why are we going to Lamanai? And to this day, he remembers this. And I think the memories of what children see, I mean, stay with them forever. And they use that when they're going to college and they write their application for college. I lived in Belize, and you wouldn't believe, but to mom and dad, it's never telling them the good stuff, but to everyone else it is. So um, what about schools? Well, there we had a major problem. We read that the literacy rate in Belize was 97%. So we um, thought, OK, we'll send them to the local schools. Well, we picked up the ninth grade book. And it was how to tell time and how to put ing at the end of a word. So we didn't know how to educate our children. Panic, panic, panic. Fortunately, we found some Americans living there who said, do the internet school. So we were able to educate our two oldest um, with the um, internet school. And this is the Mayan ruins in Lamanai uh, with middle son and the youngest. The oldest wouldn't come with us yet. He was still stuck in the hut. <laughs> <laughs> we started searching for treasure. This became a thing that reconnected our family. My husband's very competitive and we would snorkel and we would find, he would always find these old buried treasures in shallow water. And so the kids started coming out more and getting involved with things like that, things they would never do here. And um, we um, basically, they, they really started connecting with their dad, which is kind of what I wanted. Um, so our hut was really primitive, and we could only stand in for two months because the, there were no kids around. My, my kids had no one to play with. It was a retirement community of Consejo Shores, and we felt kind of bad for them, so we decided to go check out the tourist island of Ambergris Key, which is the, a beautiful island where most tourists go. And so we had our dog, Cookie, and she is sitting here in the plane, a little Cessna that flies, a puddle jumper that flies from Corozal to the <laughs> island. The pilot lets the dog sit on the seat. <laughs> and um, we ended up getting this house here uh, on the beach, and as you can tell, my husband goes from law firm to hammock, and he's in heaven. Um, and this little boy here, he's four years old. He, there was a caretaker, a 21-year-old guy and his wife who was 20, and they had a four-year-old. And my boys bonded with this little boy. He actually helped tremendously. You can see my youngest son with little uh, Juan. And they taught him how to speak English. And uh, he became part of our family for the whole time we were there. And it was just, I think, the most amazing thing for my boys to feel that they were helping someone else. Um, this is how we took our son to school. Uh, we had, we had Transportation was by boat, because we lived five miles north, no roads, um, and unfortunately I was a little scared to drive the boat, so a lot of times if my husband and I had a fight, we just had, we were stuck with each other. We had nowhere to go. I couldn't go anywhere and get away from him. We were stuck. So we had to work things out. Um, so I wanted to just give you a little excerpt from um, the family of caretakers. Juan and Teresa spoke Spanish at home, and yet their English was good. Juan summarized their short life together. He was only 21 and Teresa 20. They had married at 17 and 16 in order to have sex. Teresa said that. Sex isn't allowed until you are married, she continued. Not at all embarrassed in front of my kids. Nine months after our wedding, little Juan arrived, she added. What about high school, I asked. I quit school at 12 to work in the sugarcane fields, Swan said. I work from 5 in the morning to 5 in the afternoon, seven days a week. My boys turn quiet. I got paid $75, which I give my dad to pay for food. 
He paused, took a sip of water, and continued, I have 11 brothers and sisters. Teresa also quit school at 12 because her parents couldn't afford the books. My, my boys liked Juan and listened to every word he said. No lecture in the world could have been more effective than Juan's story in teaching my boys gratitude and how privileged they were to get an education. So those were the kind of experiences that I am so um, grateful that we did this. I mean, you can't teach children that. Um, and so how did our family grow closer in Belize? Well, we had no cable TV, no cell phones. We had computers, but everything is sporadic. The electricity turns off for about 12 hours on a Sunday. Um, and we had a satellite dish, and when there was cloud cover, we didn't get the internet. So uh, another thing that changed, too, was we no longer bought unnecessary stuff because there wasn't anything to buy. And we had a, a developed a new motto, which was, if they don't have what you want, want what they have. Um, you can, oh, this is, uh, I was going to, sorry, I'm getting a little confused here. Um, so being, getting food was a huge problem for us, because uh, we had to do it by boat, and the shops didn't have what we wanted. So, you know, one day you'd find yogurt, and then half the time it was sour because it had been sitting out on the tarmac of the little puddle jumper that came over and they did let it sit there for a couple of hours. So we learned not to eat yogurt and just eat what the locals eat. And um, uh, kids, yeah, my kids started fishing together. They started um, enjoying nature. And actually, was, I noticed a huge change when we came back. They were entertaining themselves just without TV. We had starfish like this right outside our house. The water was so clear. There, my husband reconnecting with our middle son. And then they would just sit around and talk outside. Uh, sometimes uh, tourists, guests would come and they would just huddle around and talk. And another thing they did was they, my three boys built this boat themselves in a day uh, out of plywood. And my oldest, who's now an engineer, always enjoyed cutting things out, making plans. And, and so they worked together and they became a team, something that I had never expected, which was a, a wonderful gift for me to see. As far as getting a business going, that was the such a difficult time because um, our first <coughs> business option failed due to lack of electricity lack of internet, we couldn't do an internet business using um, our contacts in the US. And we tried another business and some things happened with that, but what I ended up finding out was my kids at dinner time felt bad for us because they could see that we were struggling to try and find a job and they would come in and say, well, how about we do this? Or how about we do that, my 10-year-old? Let's start a paintball business. The local <laughs> kids need paintballing. <laughs> Things like that. So, I mean, it was just amazing how much they cared about uh, the family as a unit. So um, that's basically my quick story of uh, our year in Belize. We had to come back because we couldn't get a business going. But um, the rewards that we got were amazing from that one year. And do I have time to briefly talk about options for uh, the yeah. second part? Yes. Yeah. Yeah? Um, I told you that I was going to tell you about don't let your budget get in the way of your dreams. Uh, I'm a firm believer that there are always options in life. You just have to think differently. And one of the things that... Um, Many people would say, well, how could you, you know, you have to be rich to move to Belize. That's not true. Uh, a lot of people live in Belize on their social security checks. They can't afford to live in the U.S., mm -hmm. so they go to Belize. And that was that first place in the hut there where we were living. A lot of Americans had built little simple homes there. But the thing is, you can't live like an American. You have to adapt. I mean, things like wine, mm -hmm. filet mignon, all those things. 
A, you won't get as good quality, and B, you pay a fortune. The cheapest bottle of wine was $15, it was undrinkable a lot of times. So you drink the local beer, you eat like the locals, the rice, the beans, um, and you don't have air conditioning because there's breezes. So you just have to lower your standards if that's kind of, unless you're very rich and then you can afford to import everything from the US or wherever, but you can, the supermarkets on Ambergris Key do carry ice cream from the US and different things. They were just so expensive that we chose not to live that way. And so when my kids came back, the thing they really were looking forward to was a glass of milk, mm -hmm. fresh milk. And I thought this is amazing to come from <laughs> wanting all these gifts and presents to wanting a fresh glass of milk because we drank powdered milk for a year. Um, the other thing is, you know, you can rent your house if you have a house, you can rent your house. We have friends who had a place here and rented it out and then they would go from country to country like Guatemala and rent something for dirt cheap and still collect enough money in rent that they could live comfortably in, in those different countries. So that's another option. Then of course there's home swapping which is becoming more and more popular. I have a friend who wrote a book about that. She took her kids to Europe for about four months and they went to Ireland and England and France, spent a month in each country and they had a house in San Diego and they did house swapping. Um, house sitting is another thing. I have an Australian friend who wrote a book about house sitting and she recently got divorced and didn't have any money and for one year, she did house sitting and lived on $100 a week. So, and lived for free, taking care of people's you know, pets or watering their plants. So there's always a way. And the other thing that I think I'd like to try is couch surfing. I don't know if you've ever heard of that. <laughs> oh, yeah. uh, I have a German, uh, actually an American friend, she's in her 60s. She moved to Amsterdam, she's divorced, and she decided that she would start couch surfing. So there's a whole thing, couchsurfing.com, where you can go and stay with different people. And they've been checked out. So, you know, if somebody's dangerous, they would, of course, tell you, post it or whatever. That, and uh, that's another option for some people is maybe more young people, but more and more people are doing that. So um, that's. Oh yes, and I, I wanted to show you this magazine, I don't know, International Living. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen this. There's a little article in the June issue about an American family who went to Costa Rica and their uh, bills for electricity and water are $30 a month, whereas here they paid 400 or they were paying 400 And they found a, two, a three bedroom, two and a half bath, US style home for $1,000 with you know, the refrigerator and everything. And she says, you know, it's so much cheaper for them to live there. So you don't have to be rich to do any of these things. Uh, just have to change your mentality. And that's uh, basically what we did. And coming back to the US, my boys no longer beg for anything. They, in fact, they don't want me to give them money. A lot of times I'll say, here, they say, no, I don't want it. It's, I, I'm not joking, my youngest son, but he enlisted in the army now and he's 18. He, um, he's the one who changed the most. Um, my middle son was the one that I was scared would not, uh, he, he's a very, very uh, conscientious kid and he's, he's the one who said, you're missing my education because he, he was never a proper <laughs> child. And now he's going to go to medical school. So that year in Belize did not put him back, even though he was 14 at the time. And my oldest became a mechanical engineer and straightened out after that one year in Belize. No problems. The problems that we had faced before, all gone. And he was on the right track. So this is uh, what I wanted to share. And I, I wanted to know if all of you have put your names in here so I could do a drawing. The, my book, and um, I also wanted to mention. I'll get up. So, oh, thank you. I'm doing a 
of book launch on August 30th at Laguna Beach Books. So if any of you, I have little flyers on that desk if any of you are interested, or if you have friends who might be interested who'd like to read. And what I'd like to just finally say is that if you belong to a, sorry. No, go ahead. Oh, We're if, looking for the little pad paper that you had. Oh, um, it's not up there? Anymore? No, it's not, but we'll, we'll take oh. care of it. Keep going. Okay. Um, if any of you belong to a book club or you like to read, I would be more than happy to come to your uh, book event and talk to your friends. If you want to give me your email address or if you have it already here or you're interested, just come and see me and I, I would be happy to do that. We have so. time for like one or two questions okay. real quick. I Sorry. Know Thank you for listening. If, if, if someone has a question that they're burning to ask, mm -hmm. um, please ask now. Anyone have a question? How long did you go? We went in 2004 till 2005. Yeah. Um, so, did you find it hard to adjust coming back here? Yes. Even after six months, when I went to the local Ralph's supermarket, I stood there in front of the cereal aisle, and I felt like a stranger. I was like, I can't decide. And the sales guy came up to me. He thought I was crazy. He so was staring at the cereal like this. <laughs> and I, he, you know, I wanted to tell him, could you help me make a decision here? There's too much to pick. I could not. I Because we had just like cornflakes, one or two boxes, and that was it. So, and that was a wonderful feeling. And my son, oh, it was just, we were relaxed. We were just, this pace of life. I was driving at 40 miles an hour. Now I'm, you know, now I'm speeding all the time, back at 60 on, when I should be doing 45, I'm almost at 60. I mean, it's crazy. But, um, yeah, we... Will you do it again? Will you go back somewhere I, else? I want to go somewhere else. I would like to go to Panama. The thing is, now my kids are older, so they wouldn't come with us, but I'm ready for another adventure, and I want to do Peace Corps work. That's, I, if I could, they're hiring over 50-year-olds to go to Africa. I lived in Africa. I would love to do two years of Peace Corps. Whether my husband wants to do it is another story, but yes, definitely. Nah, he'll do it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, Sonia, thank you thank so you very much. much. Thank thank you. And you're going to hang around. So this is for um, a free copy of the book, which I'm not selling yet, but I'm giving away one copy. That's okay. Linda Dawn. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. Thank you. Um, I am doing pre-sales, so I'm selling it for $10 today if you're interested in signing up, but I don't have it available yet. So just let me know if you would like um, to sign up or if you want to come to the Arena Beach Books on the third year. But then you'll pay more because it won't be $10. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very you. much. Um, at this point, what we'd like to do is you, you should have a survey that looks like this on your tables. If you will take a moment, we're going to keep moving because um, we're running, running just about right on time, actually. Um, if you will fill this out for us, that'd be great because we're always looking for new topics that you're interested in. And so we can provide you with the right um, speakers and points of interest for you. Uh, also, in closing, I want to take a moment to speak to you about our membership. We have actually